This is it. We've made it. The last episode. You would think I'd gotten the hang of this script writing by now, but apparently that's not the case. Because I've been sitting at my desk for a long time listening to the literal crickets chirp, and nothing's been typed. I'm struggling to find the right words to bring this all to a satisfactory conclusion. And believe me when I say, I know you can't satisfy everyone. But in this case, I wonder, how do I create an ending that even satisfies myself? I emailed Rachel a little bit ago and told her I was taking the night off. But I was mistaken. With the $5.43 in my checking account, I headed to McDonald's. Then I came home and took the recycling out. But the entire time, my thoughts were on the case of Richard Nicholas. Because it's become impossible for me to mentally take the night off. It's like my brain has been tasked with solving a puzzle for over a year, but someone stole some of the pieces and someone else congratulated them for it. I can't stop thinking about it, because I know there has to be a solution. The past year has been a tremendous learning experience. I've gained a confidence that I didn't know I had, given to me by being judged negatively by people who don't even know me. I recorded a podcast in the closet of a law firm where partners make more in a day than I will in a year. I went to a prison and I almost got kicked out. I saw the photos of a crime scene where a little girl was murdered. I visited that location. I know because I took the pictures with me to make sure it was the right spot. I've made friends. I've lost friends. And I've shared a story of injustice with millions of people. I've accomplished every goal I had for this podcast and more. But yet, I still somehow feel unfinished. When I close my eyes at night, it's not the comforting darkness of sleep that greets me. It's the image of a photograph from the crime scene. It's dark. It was taken at nighttime, but it's crystal clear. The picture is of a small brown arm wearing a single gold-colored bracelet. Without context, the arm could belong to anyone, but I know it belongs to Asia. I've seen other pictures, too. The autopsy the little black braid sticking out from underneath a white sheet. I've seen the bullet wound in her face. The arm, though? The arm picture gets to me the most because it makes me feel like she's reaching, that she wants someone to help her, and I don't know how. This episode is going to be mostly my opinion, my journey, my experiences, and how I came to think what I do about what happened that night. Remember this, though. No matter what, Richard Nicholas did not get a fair trial, and that paves the road for any of us to have an unfair trial or be wrongly convicted. I'm Brooke. This is episode 11, the last one of Convicted. After a person is born, every experience that they have shapes the way they look at the world. Our interactions, our environments, our wins and our losses, they shape who we are. They create the lenses which we use to interpret the world around us and therefore help determine our behavior. My lens is influenced by social work and psychology. I look at things differently than someone who's part of the legal system or law enforcement. And that's okay because different lenses, like different perspectives, frequently lead to better understanding. In this episode, things are going to be presented through my lens, Richard, his life and choices, the evidence, and the night of the crime. I'm not asking you to agree with me, but what I want you to understand is what's influencing my opinion. I've only ever had positive interactions with law enforcement, but I'm white, my car is clean, I'm polite, and I've been told that I look and sound young. I'm lucky. Some people don't have my privilege. I think the job of a police officer is so difficult. Their job is literally to respond to other people's traumas every day. To see the worst and know the right way to handle each situation and then go about their lives like everything is okay. I give them credit. I think most police officers are well-meaning, but like in any profession, there are those who struggle. 
I think sometimes police officers lack appropriate training for many of the situations they're called to. When they do receive training, it's on things that might be outdated or mostly ineffective, like the read technique. I think they're under-resourced and overworked. But I don't think any one of those factors are the biggest contributor to a poor investigation. Law enforcement's personnel performances are based on the number of cases they close. It's not about how well they do the job, but how fast. The same thing can be said for prosecutors. Their performance isn't based on how well they strive for justice. It's on how many convictions they get. It's based on wins. When an entire justice system's performance is based on quantity and not quality, which one do you think the individual members of that system strive for? When people are rushed, they make mistakes, intentional or not. They find shortcuts, and when the shortcuts work, they keep using them. Getting the job done is important. Getting the job done right is secondary. It's hard for me to assign blame to an individual person working in this structure. It's hard to rebel against a system that's so much bigger than you. No one wants to be the troublemaker. And so the options become conform or quit. When a person conforms, they become part of the system. It shapes their lens and they no longer see the humanity in the people they're investigating or prosecuting. They see the potential to get the number, the potential to win. This is the only time I'm going to mention them in the episode, but the letters. They read to me like a celebration. Two people celebrating that they had won a difficult case against Maryland's best attorneys. The humanity was lost, the tragedy of the crime, and the denied justice of a little girl and her father. I've watched the clip of Sharon May and the Keepers 27 times. I know because Netflix tells me. Her tone doesn't translate the same to me as it did in the cold email I received. I wanted to hate her. I wanted her to seem more evil. But I can't hate her because I see her humanity. She's well-spoken and animated and charismatic. I imagine she was amazing in front of the jury. I hate the system. But as for Sharon May, I'm angry and I'm biased, but I can't bring myself to hate her. You hear horror stories about wedding planning all the time. Until now. Zola is fun, free, easy, and has everything you want. Zola is reinventing the whole wedding registry and wedding planning process to make the happiest moment in couples' lives even happier. Their registry is everything you love about your favorite department store and so much more. They carry everything you could ever want all in their online store, like 50,000 gifts, experiences, and cash funds. And they carry over 500 brands like KitchenAid and Blue Apron. You can personalize your registry with photos and notes like explaining why you can't live without a certain gift or how you intend to use the cash from a fund. Zola has a free suite of wedding planning tools, including a registry, wedding websites, and checklist and guest manager. You rarely hear the words weddings and free in the same sentence, but Zola makes it possible for today's couples. Zola is offering a special treat to our listeners. Go to zola.com slash convicted. Use Zola as your registry and they'll gift you $50 towards anything you want in their store. And they carry everything. Again, that's Zola.com slash convicted. I want to talk about Richard. What his life was like and what shaped his lens. How did he see the world? When I asked him his earliest moments, they were nonspecific, but he believed they were from Canada. Children start to acquire language while they're still babies. And through the age of five, their brains are like little language sponges absorbing everything. Richard started by acquiring French. But when he moved back to Baltimore at the age of six, his sponge was drying up and he still had an entire new language to learn. It's obvious that Richard has a neurological disorder. And I'm not convinced either way if it was because a baby doctor squeezed his head. 
Maybe it was just the way the biological material combined to create Richard. The origin of why some people stutter isn't fully understood. This is Chris. We'll talk more about him in just a minute. I'm not a speech language pathologist. I'm not, I'm not like formally trained in the stuttering world, but, but with that said, um, what I, what I really, what I think is the overarching kind of premise when it comes to stuttering is that, is that we don't really, we, we don't really have a good handle on like what the, like what the origins and the causes of it are and, those kinds of things. I mean, we generally know that 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 that, that it's a neurological d- 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 disorder, um, and people people often start stuttering in early childhood. Either way, no one noticed until he was six, and he started to stutter. He was born in the '60s. Diagnoses, research and treatment of neurological disorders have advanced so much since that time. A bullheaded kid with physical tics and a stutter who doesn't do well with eye contact might be diagnosed and treated in an entirely different way in the world today. I don't know what it's like to have a stutter, but I can understand people not wanting to listen to your words because of the way you say them. Being judged not by the message, but by the perceived quality of the messenger. It hurts, but I hope you never let it stop you. My little brother has a stutter, and by little I mean younger. He's a foot taller than me. He's stuttered ever since I've known him, and to be honest, I don't even notice it anymore. What I do notice is the reaction of the other people to his stutter. I think it's because I can't understand how someone can be made so uncomfortable just because someone doesn't speak in a way they consider typical. Maybe once, though, I was the same, because when my brother was little, I was frequently his interpreter. I would talk for him. I was a kid. I thought I was being helpful. I was trying to protect him from the mean people that were probably going to make fun of him. I think when I was younger, I would have, I would have really liked to have to have had somebody that could have spoken for me um uh you know there definitely there 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 were so many times when you know i wished i could have avoided you know making a phone call or or ordering at a restaurant and things like that um so i think when when i was younger that would have been very welcome as a person who's spoken with a stutter since childhood I asked Chris Schuyler if he would be willing to talk about his own experiences on the podcast. He wanted to make sure it was clear that these are his own opinions and experiences. He doesn't have any formal training about stuttering. I'll have Chris introduce himself. I'm an attorney. uh, Living in New York City. um, And um, I'm 32. I had to kind of check that for, 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 for a moment there in my head. Uh, yeah, 32 years old, um, and uh, that's kind of a very that's kind of a very um, high up view on, on who I am and what I'm doing. Uh, I guess so I started um, I started stuttering a pretty typical age around uh, four years old, um, and I've been stuttering ever since uh, for most of for most of my life, um, I was I was uh, I was heavily invested in controlling my stuttering as much as possible, uh, and using as many kind of techniques as I could could come up with and practice to try and kind of minimize my, you know, repetitions and um, blocks and and other types of kind of stuttering behaviors. Um, and really only kind of in the past couple years, uh, I've been sort of um, exploring more uh, the notion of trying to be more open about stuttering and kind of um, being more comfortable with being a person who stutters. Um, So that's kind of a little introduction into me. I wanted to know what Chris's treatments were like as a child who stuttered. What were the goals? What were the techniques? 
everything I'm going to be talking about is really from my experience primarily um, and my and my kind of insight or my thoughts on this and some people feel differently of course um, but but yeah I mean um, you know so I'm in my early 30s and uh, and so when, when I was a kid I think the predominant you know the the, the predominant view was really um, uh, that that was stuttering. You you wanted to minimize it as much as possible um, because there's a because it can hold you back in life and and so and so that should be that 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 should be where your focus is uh, is to try is to try and minimize it and uh, and control it and um, and so I mean I kind of picked up on that from a very young age. I, I was in uh, speech therapy. Well, I, I was in school therapy when I was a kid, so, so, I, so I'd be pulled out of class and kind of um, and made to like read through sentences and yada yada. It was, um, you know, my, my speech therapist was a very was a very pleasant person, um, but essentially it was it was being pulled out of class on a Friday afternoon and reading through like a coloring book or something. So. I don't really, but, but what was made clear was that I was working on, you know, stuttering, um, as little as I could. Uh, and, and, and one thing that happens in speech therapy, I think for, for, for a lot of people is that they end up, um, not even stuttering too much during the, like within the confines of, of the speech therapy room. Uh, but, but it's when you get back out into the world that you actually have more trouble. Um, so to, and so to answer your, to answer your kind of question, I, I just want to give you an overview that the idea is you want to limit as much as possible, but, but actually, um, as far as techniques go, you know, it, it really runs the gamut. I mean, I think there's as many techniques as you have creativity. We heard from Mary, who's always supported and defended her big brother. But from the report that Christina Gutierrez read at the end of Richard's trial, it doesn't feel like Richard had that same kind of support from his parents. The speech therapist encouraged his mother not to be so hard on him. And I might interpret that as blame. Like maybe he just wasn't trying hard enough to speak without a stutter. His dad put marbles in his mouth. And I understand that this exercise came from a good place. The origin of this practice is from an ancient Greek orator who didn't have the benefit of modern health care. No modern day speech therapist that I've talked to would support this method. Uh, well, well yeah, 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 I've heard of that. I mean, that, that's like that's like one of the more kind of barbaric kind of treatments. Well, at least in like at least in like modern like modern age stuttering. Uh, I think that was actually. Uh, I think that was kind of referenced in that movie, uh, the, 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 the King's Speech with uh, Colin Firth. I, I think there was some, I think there was, it's, it's a really good movie. Um, uh, I think that was one of the speech techniques that they used. And that was, I think, um, I, I forget which, which, which King it was, but it, but it was, uh, I think it was close to 100 years ago, but, but that was being done then. Um, yeah. So, so yes, I've heard of that. I can't stand the thought of putting something foreign in my mouth. Even things that belong there, like dental impression kits, repulse me. The thought of marbles being put in my mouth and being told to read is terrifying. It would also make me feel like I was broken, and maybe I just wasn't trying hard enough. Can I ask a favor? Acknowledging that we all have our biases. If someone speaks in a way that you're not accustomed to, it's okay if your immediate reaction is negative. But please, recognize your bias and strive to listen past it. Focus on the content of what the person is saying. You might be surprised at how quickly the message becomes the focus and the perceived anomalies in their speech fade into the background. I don't know a lot about Richard's parents, except that he loved them and they loved him. His mother had bipolar disorder, but Richard says that she did what she needed to to take care of herself. When I've talked to him about it, he becomes protective of her. 
stigma about mental illness still exists today. But during the time Richard was growing up, stigma was an even bigger burden to bear. A doctor I once worked with, a psychiatrist, told me that women who have bipolar disorder have a one in four chance of having a child with the same disorder. I don't think Richard has bipolar disorder, but my friend Amber Lee, the guest from episode 7.5, told me that there's been an influx of research on mothers with bipolar disorder giving birth to children with neurological disorders. The likelihood of a neurological disorder is increased when a child is fathered by someone who is nearing or over 40 years old, like Richard's father. Another risk factor for a neurological disorder is the use of forceps by a baby doctor during delivery. Knowing his history and understanding the immense pressure that was put on Richard as a young child to behave like a neurotypical person helps me to understand what caused him to drop out of high school. He didn't feel like he fit in. He was bullied. He couldn't communicate in the way he was supposed to, according to those around him. How do you stand up for yourself when your words are the very thing that the bullies have latched on to? He went to an alternative high school and he made friends. That's a big deal. He made friends. They described him as a goofball. He'd do things like having eating contests with dogs. Hinda, part of the group of friends, told me that she once asked why the others treated Richard the way they did. She then said that she realized he liked it that way. I imagine to a man that didn't receive a lot of positive interaction from his peers as a child, having friends felt good. Not knowing though quite how to fit in he might do things that made others laugh, even at his own expense, because he liked the attention. He got married. The Baltimore Sun says that his ex-wife says that he hit her, but he denies it. I wrote to her, but I never heard back. I wasn't there. I don't know what happened. Though it doesn't feel like the behavioral response from the goof of the group the one that does things to embarrass himself to maintain friendships, a person who's searching for acceptance. But it's possible. After the divorce, he did a little bit of this and a little bit of that and wound up working two jobs. It doesn't seem like he had much money, though. He was young, and money management wasn't his strong point. Believe me, I can relate. His jobs were in different fields, he hung out with people he called friends, but by their apparent attitudes towards him, I think maybe it was frequently one-sided. He had a one-night stand, and the woman got pregnant. He knew he was going to be a dad, but knowing that and understanding its implications are different things. When the baby was born, he didn't know how to be a dad. He didn't know how to give the baby the support she needed. Communication with others had never been his strong point, and he told me that his relationship with his own father had been strained. He didn't always make the best parenting decisions, and this is not an excuse, but rather an explanation. It seems to me that he didn't have the tools in his toolbox that were required for fatherhood at the time. I'm not saying that he couldn't have gained them, but it's hard when you're an adult and no one is there to teach you. You learn from watching others, maybe from watching TV. He bought a life insurance plan on his daughter. I still remember the commercials on TV for the Gerber Grow Up plan. It's a life insurance plan that doubles as a savings account for children. The child can collect the money when they're at the age of maturity. They sell hundreds of thousands of these plans each year because people are buying them, because they do have use and because they're marketed extremely well. He canceled the policy and then a year later bought another one. The second policy doesn't make it clear if just Richard or both parents are the beneficiaries. Not that it mattered anyway. The money was for Asia. The policy didn't pay the full amount until the child reached the age of maturity. Before that, it was only worth a couple of thousands of dollars. Less than what a good attorney bills in a day's work. To be fair, Asia's mother also had a life insurance policy on her as well. And she was the sole beneficiary. The point being, 
life insurance on children isn't an uncommon occurrence in this country. Richard didn't pay child support until it was ordered by the court. And then after that, it was pretty consistent. He had it withdrawn from his payroll checks at one of his jobs. Then one day, the collection agent decided she wanted the money to come from the other job. I'm paraphrasing, but she says in her testimony, she sent a notice to the first job to stop withholding the money, but she didn't tell Richard. Months later, when she did tell Richard, he filled out the paperwork and payments resumed again. He didn't spend very much time with his child, but she knew who he was. She called him daddy, and she was happy when they were together. So at this point in his life, Richard has two jobs, but never quite enough money. He loves his child, but he doesn't quite know how to interact with her. He makes attempts to be a father the best way he can figure out how. He prepares for her future. He brings teddy bears and sometimes diapers. He went on a family outing to the beach. He's not a perfect dad, but he also wasn't a malicious one. Asia was murdered, and Richard went to prison for it, where he's been for the past 20 years. I love Blue Apron because it saves me time and money. I don't have to go to the store to get a ton of ingredients, and the meals come pre-proportioned, so I don't have to get more than I need of something. It's pretty amazing. For less than $10 per person per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-proportioned ingredients to make a delicious home-cooked meal. You can choose from a variety of recipes each week or let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you. Recipes are not repeated within a year, so you'll never get bored. Each meal comes with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card and pre-proportioned ingredients that can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. And Blue Apron's freshness guarantee promises that every ingredient in your delivery arrives ready to cook or they'll make it right. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash convicted. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash convicted. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. He becomes the Richard that I know, the man that I met and spoken with at length. Richard is polite and respectful. I can say that without any stretching of the truth or fact. He's also serious, and by that I mean he doesn't joke around, and he definitely doesn't get my humor, which generally comes in the form of sarcasm. He likes routine, and sometimes I've noticed he gets stuck on things or topics. He has trouble describing feelings. I ask those type of questions a lot. How did that make you feel? And frequently I get an answer about a physical response, but not an emotion. I feel like several of our phone calls were spent reviewing the reason a particular item couldn't be included in the podcast, like copyrighted music. He repeats himself, not like a stutter, But when a certain point is important to him, I'm bound to hear about it more than once, per call. He's thorough, and he appears to be organized, though I've never seen his physical possessions. He follows directions, and that's earned him favor in his current institution. And more than once, he's told me that he doesn't do anything that Rachel doesn't approve of, because he knows that she has his best interest at heart. At this time in his life, He's an organized, rule-following inmate, who's to say the least very thorough in everything that he does. Good behavior and rule-following 20 years later doesn't make a person innocent. It does make them easier to interact with, though. Maybe in Richard's black and white, good or bad, decision-making process, he's learned that following the institutional rules gets him that same attention as racing a dog to eat a sandwich. He feels accepted there. Then, one day, someone is compelled to make a podcast about his legal journey. I imagine it's both flattering and scary to know that more people are going to know your story, but to not have any creative control on its telling. I visited Richard several times in prison, but only once on my own. It was the day before episode one dropped. We talked on Thursday night, and I was supposed to ride with Rachel and visit him on Friday. 
During the course of our conversation, I became frustrated. In hindsight, it was my fault. That doesn't matter, though. What does matter is that I didn't go to the prison with Rachel on Friday. I'm not proud to admit it, but I had chosen the silent treatment. I had two days left in Maryland, and I quickly realized that I was going to regret my decision. I needed to see him again, to talk to him at least one more time before the podcast was released. I made a deal with myself that if I woke up by 6 a.m., I'd go. That morning, without my alarm, I woke up at 5.59 a.m., and I knew I had to do it. I made this recording in the car as I started my journey to the prison. I have to warn you, I'm not a morning person, so I sound a little... Okay, I sound a lot like I'm whining. So it's like 6.27 a.m. I am in Howard County, Maryland, and yesterday my plans got discombobulated, so I did not get to go see Richard. The podcast is coming out on Monday, and I would like to think that it's not going to affect my ability to talk to him or see him ever again. But since I didn't get to see him yesterday like I was supposed to, I really want to see him again today to at least maybe shake his hand or, I don't know, have some kind of in-person closure in case I'm not able to do this again. But um, it's raining, it's gross out, I'm tired. This podcast has been hard work. It's been really, really hard work. And whatever is compelling me to drive two and a half hours to see Richard, I hope it compels you to listen to his story and at least think about it. I made another recording on the way home as not to lose the emotion in the moment. This is what my visit was like. I get out of the prison and it's still raining. So I run in my little flip flops across the parking lot to my car. But I have to tell you about today. I'm not a person who believes in fate or destiny or that things are all gonna work out the way they're supposed to. But today I might have changed my mind. Um, so I went into the prison and this was my first time there as a friend. Um, last time I had gone to do research to make sure that I, this was the podcast that I wanted to devote myself to. And um, so I'm wearing my actual innocence t-shirt, my prison bra, which I bought that has no underwire in it because I know that that will set off the metal detector. And a pair of jeans and some flip-flops. I left my jacket, I left everything else in the car except for my license because I knew I was gonna need that. So I, um, I go in and I say, this is my first time here as a visitor. I'm not sure what to do. So I filled out a little form and um, it didn't say it on the website, but I noticed on the counter, it said, you know, no underwire. So I was thankful that I had my, my prison bra to take with me. And then I put my shoes in the little bucket and they go through the scanner and I walk through the metal detector and it goes off. And I was like, what is happening? Because I was, I had nothing in my pockets. Like I had them pulled out of my pants, like turned out of my pants. And um, so I went back onto the other side and I had a hair clip in that was plastic, but I took it off just to be safe. And so I handed my hair clips to the lady prison guard. There was two women and one man. And so um, I walk back through and it goes off again. And the woman who was in charge of the metal detector tells me that I only get one more chance. You can only go through three times or, or you can't go in. So I'm like feeling my whole body. I cannot figure out what is setting off this metal detector and you know, I had just driven two and a half hours, gotten up really early with no sleep, and and I really wanted to see him. And so 
I walk through the third time and the metal detector goes off. So I just stand there with what I imagine is the most disappointed look I could, I'd ever had. And um, they give me a paper to sign. I'm not sure, I, I read it, but basically it said that I consent to being searched. And so they brought over like a little wand and it was the clips, the little black, or the little, the little clips that latch to the back of your bra together or a person's bra together. Mine apparently had metal in them and it was setting off the metal detector. And the woman looked at me and she said, you know, just this one time we're gonna let you go ahead and go in. So that was pretty, that was pretty amazing. Um, so I went in and sat in the waiting room and I, I sat there and the other woman, the one who had been like in charge of, in the front of the desk, came to me and said, are you an attorney? And I said, no. I said, I had done some work with his attorney, but you know, I'm just, I'm just a friend visiting right now. And she was like, well, he has you listed as an attorney. And then explained to me something that I didn't understand about legal visits and, and I'm, I'm not sure because I'm not an attorney. And so I thought I was gonna get kicked out. But again, she just says to me, this other lady, you know, you need to tell him to change you to friend on the list if you're gonna visit. And I said, okay, I will. And she let me stay. So I go through the whole black light stamp airlock process and I get back there and I see him sitting at one of the visitor booths that look like study carols. And he has this huge smile on his face. And we talked for a little over an hour. And at the end I said, you know, um, that says you can embrace at the end and I don't want to kiss you or anything, but, but can I shake your hand? And so we walked down to the, to the goodbye part and I shook his hand and he smiled at me and he said, thank you so much. And that was one of the most meaningful connections I think that I've ever had with someone. And I'm so glad that I was able to do it. I don't want to get anyone in trouble, but I want to say thank you. Thank you to those people who let me in because you, you really made my day and you really made his day. The Richard of 1998 was making his child support payments and he was trying to see his daughter more often. He was making an effort and to be completely honest, I don't think that was all him. I think he was following orders. His family began to pressure him into doing the right thing, advising him on how to be a father, telling him to pay his child support. He learned that in the eyes of his family, the choices he was making were wrong and he needed to be a better dad. I believe Richard usually is black and white in his decision making, like both of his parents have also been described. Things are good or not good. A person is right or they're wrong. There aren't that many shades of gray. I'm not Richard, and I've had different life experiences, and I grew up in a different time. And sometimes to me, it seems like there are only shades of gray, especially when it comes to justice. I don't think you have to be team prosecutor or team defense to form an opinion on what happened that night. And to be clear, I absolutely do not think Asia was killed in the mall parking lot and left in the car while Richard watched Pinocchio. It's absurd. He picked up Asia from her mother's house and put her into his car without a car seat. Things were different in the 90s, but don't think that every day he doesn't realize that if she'd been in the back of the car in a car seat, that she might still be alive. They drove to the movie. We have proof that a ticket was bought at 6.50 and a picture that was taken in a photo booth. No credible witnesses were able to testify to the fact that Asia or Richard were even at the movie, though her stomach did have food consistent with popcorn in it. But consistent with, like in the case of GSR, doesn't prove anything. It just means it's possible. 
Richard told me a story about taking Asia to the bathroom at the theater, and I believed it, just because it was so normal. A little girl in the men's room running out of toilet paper? Who would think to make that up as part of a cover-up for a murder? And there's the photo booth picture, with that huge open mouth smile. That little girl was not afraid. The movie started, and near the end they leave. They probably didn't stay for the credits, and Asia was sleepy anyway. He carried her back to the car, and they were on their way to Asia's house. I can't tell you what happened next. I wasn't there. Before I make my next statement, I want you to remember that this is only my opinion based on how I see the world. I struggle with the road rage story. I mean, it's possible that it happened exactly the way Richard said. There are certain aspects that give me pause, though, even though I have no evidence to support that. What I believe is that after the car was parked on Bowley's Lane, and after his daughter had been shot, he was telling the truth. I was there. I saw the hotel and where the McDonald's used to be, and the Texaco, that has a different name now. I believe he ran to that Texaco for help. He didn't get it, though. He got blame. He got injustice. He got convicted. Just because of my hesitation about the road rage story, it doesn't mean that I'm part of Team Prosecutor. Because above all things, I do not believe Richard Nicholas looked at his beautiful daughter sitting next to him, held up a gun, and shot her in the face, and then left her in a mall parking lot. Despite my thoughts on road rage, I absolutely do not think that he killed her. What fuels that belief for me? There's no motive unless you consider the less than $2,000 value of the life insurance policy, which I don't. If buying a life insurance policy on your child makes you a murderer, I suspect that the FBI will be raiding Gerber headquarters any day now for information on policyholders. There's no credible evidence that he fired a gun or that he ever came in contact with a murder weapon. In fact, there's no murder weapon at all. Plus, to fire with his left hand, sitting in a car, and being a big man who towered over her, how could the bullet not have had a downward slant to it? There was no murder weapon at all. Where could it have gone in that tight of a time frame? There's no evidence of fixed lividity at the scene, and if there were, we've got bigger problems because Asia would have had to have been dead before he even picked her up. There's no fact-based evidence presented that convinced me that he pulled the trigger or makes me think that he was the murderer. I do understand, though, why he was convicted. They chose a jury whose foreman did the right thing in admitting that he couldn't be impartial. There may have been some other jury issues, but I don't have the proof. The prosecution assassinated his character and followed it with junk science from a medical examiner who recanted and a GSR tech that was later proven to have misrepresented GSR evidence in other cases. They called witnesses to testify about a state of mind who weren't qualified to give it. Emotional health, mental health, behavioral health, those are all sciences, and they're real. If you need a doctor to testify that someone suffered from a broken leg or that they had a heart attack, you most certainly need a doctor to testify as to the condition of someone's mental and behavioral health. In fact, in that same vein, Would any witness ever be asked if someone acted like they weren't in enough pain to be having a heart attack? No wonder Richard struggles with stigma. Trying to fit together so many puzzle pieces. I just can't make them fit in a way that would make him the killer. The evidence just isn't there. As I said once on my very first call with A&E about Cold Case Files, the podcast. Wait, can we talk about me now? Richard has never wavered from his original story of what happened that night. He's not given me any secret information from which I'm basing the hypothetical situation that I'm about to share. What my hypothetical is based on is my knowledge of human behavior and my attempt to put myself in the shoes of someone who has experienced something more terrible than I ever hoped to know. Let's say I went to the movies with my younger brother. I let him sit in the front seat. I can't remember if I made him buckle up or not. When we got there, we realized the movie was an hour later than we expected. 
I realized there was someone I was supposed to meet afterwards, but the timing was going to make me late. When we leave, my previous commitment is nagging at me. It feels like something I have to do. It's not really a child's activity, but my brother was asleep, so what could it hurt? I mean, the stop was on the way. So I do it. I meet up with a person I'd planned to see. My brother is still sleeping soundly in the front seat. We get into an argument, though, the person I'm meeting and I. And then, in a horrendous turn of events, something that I never expect happened happens. My loved one is killed. The weight of the moment comes crashing down on me. I'm in a place I shouldn't be, meeting someone that was obviously not good news. And my loved one was murdered. And I'm afraid and shocked. I called for help, and so when the police came, I have to make a decision. Do I reveal why I had veered off course on the way home, or do I tell the truth? Think about it. Have you ever had to make a decision to tell the truth and lose your integrity, or lie and potentially keep it? I know I have. More than once. It's human nature. It's self-preservation. With so much guilt for not having waited to meet up with the person until after I dropped off my brother, I lie about how I ended up there, though I tell as much truth as possible. The entire time it never crossed my mind to lie about the murder. I didn't need to. Simply because I didn't do it. The police don't have any other suspects, and they need those numbers, because that's what their performance is based on. So I find myself being arrested. My lie, which seems less necessary at this point, is being piled onto by the lies of police officers. I'm confident I won't be convicted at trial, because I did not commit this murder. The thing is, I also can't tell the truth, because that would make me a liar. I'm trapped. I'm stuck in my lie. And so I just keep quiet. I follow my attorney's orders. I think we all understand this. We all have that one thing that we can't tell anyone because no one would understand. We don't want to be seen as a bad person, so we keep it in. It's like the skeleton in our closet that we just can't let out. I have the best attorneys. Surely they can prove I didn't do something that I actually did not do. Unfortunately, though, the prosecution cheats. They need to get their numbers also, and they see me as a potential win. They pile on another lie to the stack, and then another, and then another. The stack of lies is so high that it's hard for me to see the truth beneath them all. With all the lies on the pile that the jury hears, I'm convicted. I'm not only trapped in a prison made of bars and concrete being ordered around by guards. I'm trapped in the prison of my lie, and the worst part is knowing that I can never come clean. And I'm haunted by the fact that my original lie is what caused the domino effect leading to my current situation. Sometimes I feel like I don't belong in prison, that I'm not guilty of the charge that sentenced me to die here. Other times... I know that I didn't commit the murder that I was convicted of, and the walls around me feel like a tomb. The guilt in my heart over the entire situation sometimes makes me feel like I'm suffocating. Remember, that's just my hypothetical. I don't know if any of that could be applied to any actual case. It's just what I've come up with on how I would react based on my knowledge of human behavior. It's like a pink elephant. As of late, I've struggled with faith in the justice system, but the one thing that I'm absolutely certain of is that innocent or guilty or somewhere in between, Richard Nicholas did not get a fair trial. I don't know that he can ever get relief in an appeal system that, that puts the burden on a guilty man to prove innocence or denies a ruling of a judge that corrects incorrect facts. I'm going to beg you one last time to donate to Richard's fund at convictedpod.com under the support tab. This story could have belonged to any one of us or any one of our relatives. It's not about innocence or guilt. It's about giving a man a fair trial. Convict him if he's guilty. Set him free if he's innocent. But either way, do it by following the rules. There's one thing I've learned reading through the trial and the motions and the hearings. 
It's that justice isn't real. The lady with the blindfold holding the scale, she doesn't exist. We're all human. We all have biases and we all have a role in justice. Those qualities combined equal an imperfect system. I'm not an attorney, so take this the way you will. But I think the only way for Richard and by association Asia to get any kind of justice has nothing to do with Brady violations or habeas hearings or three judge panels. It's too late for that. I think the way to justice in this case is for someone to put the puzzle together from that night, to look at the pictures and find out who's holding the gun. People keep asking me what's next for Convicted. Will there be a season two? Will it be about Richard? Will it be about another case? The truth is, I don't know. I am so proud of this podcast and the awareness that it's brought, but I'm also tired and broken in spirit by the truth that it's made me face. I do know that if there is another season to be made, the announcement will be made on this feed. So even though this is the last episode for now, I wouldn't unsubscribe quite yet. Thank you so much to Richard for sharing his story with me and allowing me to be the one to tell it. And thank you to Mary for letting me in. There are so many people who have contributed in one way or another that I'm afraid if I start naming names, I won't be able to stop or I'll forget someone and their feelings will be hurt. If you think you're one of them, you probably are. That being said, there are a few names I have to mention because without them, Convicted would not have existed. So I want to say thank you to my team, Rachel and Blake, two of the most amazing people I've ever worked with. The behind the scenes volunteers who help with the website and transcripts and social media and voiceovers, Sean and Cameron and Christina and TJ. The people who help keep me sane and behind the mic, Emily and Erica and Jordan and pretty much all of Audio Boom. And I wanted to say thank you to Catherine for thinking I'm good enough. So for the last time, for at least a while, I'm Brooke. Thank you so much for listening.